broadly, we are happy that the Companies Act, which was passed in 2013, is being revisited. I would have, however, liked the Minister, the Honourable Finance Minister, who is not here when the bill was introduced, to have taken a little more effort to explain certain provisions of the bill. Unless one keeps the original act, the Companies Amendment Bill of 2016, the recommendations of the Standing Committee and the new bill, it's very difficult for members to understand what had been done, what was recommended to be changed, and what change was brought about first in 2016 and what change is being brought about now. But I've tried my best in the short time that was available to me to try to make sense of what the government is doing. It seems to me that the government wants to help small and medium companies and save those companies from the rigors of company law. I think it's a noble objective. But the way that you've gone about it will have perverse consequences. You have only one act. That act applies to large companies, to medium companies, and to small companies. If you make provisions in that act, keeping in mind what you want to do only for small and medium companies, the consequence will be inevitably the relaxation that you give will apply to large companies also. The only part of that dilemma is to make a separate law for what you define as small and medium companies. In fact, my personal view is, and I don't know if this is my party's view, eventually we must have a separate law for small and medium companies and have a very comprehensive Companies Act only for large companies. Now, this amendment bill is a revisitation of the Companies Amendment Bill of 2016. The author of the 2016 bill and the author of the 2017 bill are the same. But I'm glad that some provisions have been revisited. But I'm also unhappy that some provisions have been revisited. I think in the name of liberalization, there are some provisions which I think are undesirable and will have negative consequences. But let me begin by making one broad statement. I don't want to take all the time for my party because there are a number of examples that can be given. The sense I get is that in the case of many provisions, instead of making the provision in the Act, the government has said, as prescribed, which means will be made in the rules. Now, while some years ago that may have been a correct way to make laws, modern thinking points to greater transparency in the laws, greater definition in the laws, greater certainty in the laws. And I would therefore urge the government to reconsider the provisions where they have virtually taken away power from parliament and vested in the executive. And matters that should be provided 
in the bill are being provided now by rules. I think this is really a regression. I know some people will argue that some of these provisions cannot be made in the law. I disagree. I think with paying sufficient attention and sufficient time to these matters, some of these restrictions, some of these conditions can be made in the law itself so that very large degree of discretion is not vested in the executive. I can give examples, but I don't want, I won't take time to give those examples. Sir, let me point out some very glaring inadequacies in the bill. Firstly, the Original Companies Act 2013 had a number of wholesome provisions which were sought to be diluted in the Companies Amendment Bill of 2016. Some of the recommendations of the Standing Committee restored the original provisions of the 2013 bill, but some, in fact, made it worse. In the 2017 bill, I'm glad that many of the provisions in the 2013 bill have been restored. It only uh, underlines the fact that there was some wisdom in the previous government, too. And uh, the previous government did not entirely lack in wisdom. And some of the provisions made in the 2013 bill are being restored. And I am uh, grateful to the Finance Minister, Honorable Finance Minister, for acknowledging that the provisions of the 2013 bill were good provisions. So I'm concerned about the provision that you're making in a number of sections regarding late filing. The original Act of 2013, penalties were imposed for late filing. after the recommendations of the Standing Committee, what you have now done is, instead of laying down the limits in the Act, power is being taken to the Executive to lay down the limits. This is one of the examples of the point that I made earlier. Why are the limits not being laid down in the Act itself? So that there is greater clarity, greater certainty of what a company shall do and what a company shall not do. There are a number of such provisions. I would urge that whatever limits are being prescribed must be prescribed in the Act so that there is absolute certainty and clarity if those time limits have to be changed, you have to come back to Parliament. Taking uncontrolled discretion to the executive indeed makes the executive look more powerful, the minister looks more powerful, the secretary looks more powerful. But by taking that power, you are actually diminishing the role of Parliament. The second provision which I would draw attention to is, in the case of an audit, there was a restriction that if there was a relative associated with a company, that person cannot be an auditor. 
I concede that the original provision was rather loosely worded. But instead of amending that provision and making the definition tighter, what you have done is you have deleted the definition of relative. Now, if you look at the act, look at the section. My book, my book, my, book, my company's act. If you look at the section now, after deleting the definition of relative, the section will read that the following person shall not be eligible for appointment as an auditor of a company, namely, F, a person whose relative is a director or is in the employment of the company. Or a director or a key managerial personnel. And if you now delete that, if you now delete that, in the section and substituted by in clause I a person who directly or indirectly renders any service referred to in section 144 or its holding company the subsidiary company for the purpose of this clause the term directly or indirectly what are you trying to do what are you trying to say it's not Clear what you're trying to say. Are you debarring a certain number of persons whose relatives are associated or are you not? I think there must be clarity in that provision and I'm sure that the Honorable Minister has a reason why he is doing it and he will explain to us in course of time why he's doing it. Sir, there is another provision that you may take loans from and give loans to directors of a company. Those tensible purposes, this will help SMEs. And as I said in my opening state, opening remarks, if you want to make such a provision to help SMEs, please realize that the same provision will apply to large companies also. So today, the effect of this provision, unless the Honorable Minister tells me why my, my understanding is not correct, in a large company also, you can take loans from and give loan to directors. Now that, I think, is completely unacceptable. Nowhere in the world are companies allowed to take loans from and give loans to directors. In fact, severe restrictions must be placed on companies taking loans from and giving loans to directors. The directors occupy a fiduciary position to the shareholders of the company and now, in fact, to the stakeholders in the company. And I do not think that a company should be allowed to give loans to or take loans from a company. There are other forms of ownership, like limited liability partnership or partnerships or proprietorships, where the rules are far more relaxed. But once you incorporate yourself as a joint stock company, I think we must accept standards that are accepted all over the world. And we should not, in order to make special provisions for small and medium companies, make a provision which will ultimately be available to large companies also. Another provision to which I take serious objection to is the Act as it stands prohibited insider trading and forward dealing by companies.
In the 2016 bill that the Honorable Minister introduced, these provisions were sought to be deleted. The prohibition was sought to be deleted. The Standing Committee recommended harmonize it with the SEBI's provisions. Now, what have you done? If the original provision is sought to be retained, section 458 is sought to be retained to prohibit insider trading and forward trading, then I think it's important that this must be harmonized with the SEBI's provisions. And we look at the original section, the original section did provide that insider trading and forward trading will be prohibited. If that appears to be your intention, I welcome that intention. But then SEBI has another set of regulations, SEBI has another set of provisions which deal with insider trading and forward trading. So I think it's important that whatever provision you are making must be in harmony with SEBI's provisions. And there's no reason why, while you retain the original provision and prohibition, you should not harmonize it with the SEBI's provisions. Sir, so, there are some other provisions related to private placement. I think it's not been thought through correctly. Today you've made a provision where any company can do a private placement. Private placement must be an exception. Again, I realize you're trying to do this to help small and medium companies. But the provision that you make for small and medium companies will also be available to large companies. And I think private placement by itself should be avoided. Companies must make public offers. And if a large company can make a private placement, I think it's not consistent with the modern concept of, a, of corporate responsibility and, and corporate functioning. So I would urge the Honorable Finance Minister to revisit this provision about private placement. I think it's not a good provision. It's certainly, to the best of my understanding, not consistent with what is available in the rest of the world. Lastly, sir, the provision of an independent director. Now, an independent director must be truly independent. Now, what has been provided now is that if an independent director has a small interest, I remember it's something like not exceeding 10% or so, that would not in any way detract from his independence and he can continue to be an independent director. Again, apparently the idea in the back of your mind is to help a small and medium company. But when you do that for a small and medium company by amending the act or making a provision for that in the act, the result is that even large companies will benefit. Now, if you have an independent director in a company which has a, a turnover of a thousand crore or a net worth running into several thousand crores, even a small pecuniary interest, even a small interest in that company will amount to a very large absolute interest. So I think if you really want independent directors on the board, and it's quite difficult to find truly independent directors, you must ensure that their independence is 
preserved and advanced and not create exceptions by which their independence can be called in question. By and large, I welcome this bill, but I would urge that while the thought in your mind that small and medium companies should be benefited, should have a lighter touch, if when you make provisions in one act that is available to us, those lighter regulations will begin to apply to large companies also, and you will face serious problems when these large companies take advantage of these provisions. We can make a list of the provisions which I think should apply only to small and medium companies. But without making such a distinction between small and medium companies and large companies, some of the provisions here will have perverse consequences. It's my duty to caution the government, caution the Honorable Finance Minister, and caution this House that will, will we pass this bill with laudable objectives largely to benefit small and medium companies, we are perhaps creating opportunities for large companies to indulge in malfeasance. So I would, in conclusion, urge the Honorable Minister to look at some of these provisions and create a separate chapter by which these provisions where you want to make special provisions will apply only to small and medium companies and will not apply to large companies. Finally, say I want to say the corporate governance in this country leaves much to be desired. It's perhaps a, a, a legacy issue. The original Companies Act of 1956 was amended piecemeal over a period of time. It took us almost uh, 60 years to bring a new Companies Act. In the meanwhile, we've had numerous examples of corporate excesses. We had numerous examples of corporations failing, corporations failing to be properly regulated. Even today, I think the regulation of corporations by the Department of Company Affairs leaves much to be desired. For a long time, thousands of companies which did not even file returns continue to remain on the register. The department was either sleeping on the job or lazy, did not even strike out these names from the register. Now I'm told some effort has been made and about 100,000 companies have been struck out of the register. How many more remain, I do not know. Thousands of companies did not file returns and no action was taken. I sincerely hope that the administration of the department is tightened, made stronger, more effective, and more professional people are brought into the administration of companies. We cannot imagine a business world today without the joint stock company. The joint stock company is perhaps one of the most innovative mechanisms to mobilize capital and to start a business and create wealth. The joint stock company has gone through several transformations. We are going through one now when we're amending the 2013 Act. And while we make this transformation, I think we should keep in mind that these joint stock companies must be regulated, must be regulated with a great degree of certainty so that people know what shall be done and what shall not be done. While I therefore broadly welcome this bill, I would once again urge the Honorable Finance Minister to identify the special provisions that he wishes to make for small and medium companies and make a separate chapter for those companies <coughs> rather than do it in the Companies Act. Thank you, sir.